Mr. Prescott, I swear I didn't take anything. The necklace didn't just vanish into thin air. It was found with your cleaning supplies. Do you think I'm stupid? I've worked here for years. You know me. You know I would never... What I know, David interrupted coldly, is that I trusted you, and you betrayed that trust. Pack your things. You're fired. Maria stood frozen, her heart pounding. The accusation stung as much as the dismissal. Before she could say another word, David stormed out, leaving her to gather her belongings in in stunned silence. Maria's life was far removed from the luxury of the Prescott estate. A single mother raising her teenage son, Javier, she worked tirelessly to keep food on the table and a roof over their heads. Her days were long, spent cleaning homes for the wealthy, and her nights were often consumed with worry about bills and her son's future. Despite her hardships, Maria prided herself on her honesty and hard work, but today her integrity, her very lifeline, had been questioned, and she she knew she couldn't let the accusation stand. Maria left the Prescott mansion that day humiliated, her head held high despite the weight of David's cruel words. The memory of his accusations gnawed at her during her walk home. Her son, Javier, met her at the door, his cheerful greeting faltering when he saw her face. What happened, Mama? He asked, his concern immediate. Maria forced a smile, brushing off the question. Nothing I can't handle, she said, ruffling his hair. But inside her anger and confusion, boiled who had planted the necklace and why. She thought of Claire Daniels, David's assistant, whose hesitant glances during the confrontation hinted at knowing more than she let on. Determined to clear her name, Maria reached out to a lawyer, Alan Carter, a man known for his dedication to underdogs like her. Sitting in his modest office the next morning, Maria recounted the incident in painstaking detail. Alan listened intently, his brow furrowing as she spoke. I've heard about David Prescott. Alan said when she finished. He's powerful, but that doesn't make him untouchable. You're saying you have no idea how the necklace ended up with your things? Maria nodded. None. But I do know this isn't just about a necklace. There's something else going on in that house. Alan leaned back in his chair. If we're going to fight this, we'll need more than your word. Is there anyone who might back up your story? Someone who knows what's really happening? Maria hesitated. Claire's conflicted expression flashed in her mind. Maybe, but I don't know if she'll speak up. Alan's gaze sharpened. Then we'll have to give her a reason to. Meanwhile, at the Prescott Mansion, David basked in his self-assurance. He entertained guests in his study, recounting how he had dealt with Maria. You can't let these people think they can take advantage, he said smugly, swirling a glass of whiskey. Then one day, as David Prescott sat in his sprawling office, his assistant, Claire Daniels, entered cautiously, a thick envelope clutched in her hand, her knuckles white against the paper. Mr. Prescott, this just arrived. David barely looked up, swirling his drink with a practiced air of disinterest. What is it? Claire approached, placing the envelope on his desk. It's a notice from the court. Miss Torres has filed a lawsuit. David's brow furrowed. He picked up the envelope, ripping it open with an impatient tug. His eyes scanned the contents and his jaw tightened as he read. She's suing me, he muttered, his tone laced with disbelief. For what? Losing her job for stealing? She claims wrongful termination and defamation, Claire said. And she's hired Alan Carter. David's grip on the letter tightened. Alan Carter, that ambulance chaser? He's got a reputation for fighting for people like her. David tossed the letter onto his desk with a snarl. This is absurd. She won't make it past the first hearing. Claire stood silently, watching as David's irritation boiled over. Should I call Veronica? She asked, referring to his high-powered attorney. Yes, David snapped. Tell her to be here by tomorrow morning. If Maria wants a fight, she's about to get one. Claire nodded and turned to leave, but not before casting a fleeting glance at the notice. She couldn't shake the feeling that Maria's accusations were only the tip of the iceberg. The courtroom was a stark contrast to the luxury of the Prescott Mansion. Its polished wood benches and sterile walls echoed with whispers as people gathered to witness the drama unfold. Maria sat at the plaintiff's table, her hands clasped tightly in her lap. Alan Carter, her lawyer, adjusted his glasses and flipped through his notes, projecting calm confidence. Across the room sat David Prescott, his tailored suit and easy smirk a picture of arrogance. His lawyer, an imposing figure named Named Veronica Hayes leaned in close, whispering instructions. Behind David, a small crowd of reporters scribbled in notebooks, sensing a juicy story in the tension that hung heavy in the air. The judge entered, and everyone rose. Maria's heart thudded in her chest as the trial began. Veronica Hayes was the first to speak. She strode to the center of the courtroom with the confidence of someone who had won 
cases twice as complex and thrice as dirty. Ladies and gentlemen, she began, her tone smooth and practiced. This is a straightforward case of betrayal and theft. Mr. Prescott trusted the plaintiff, Maria Torres, to work in his home, to be around his family and his valuables. And what did she do with that trust? She stole it, quite literally, when she took a family heirloom worth more than most people's yearly salary. David sat back in his chair, a faint smile playing on his lips as Veronica continued. We have evidence the necklace was found with the plaintiff's cleaning supplies. Her financial struggles provided a clear motive, and Mr. Prescott's swift actions protected his household from further harm. Veronica gestured to the jury. This case isn't about malice, it's about accountability. Mr. Prescott had no choice but to act decisively to protect his family. She returned to her seat, confident she had framed Maria as guilty in the jury's eyes. Alan stood next, adjusting his tie. His tone was gentler, his words carrying the weight of sincerity. This is a case of power versus truth, he began. Maria Torres has worked for Mr. Prescott's household for almost a decade. She's raised her son alone, worked tirelessly to make an honest living, and always carried herself with integrity. Alan paused, letting his words sink in. The accusation against Maria is not only baseless, it's malicious. She didn't steal anything. The necklace was planted to discredit her, to silence her. And as this trial progresses, we'll show you why. Maria felt a swell of gratitude for Alan as he continued, Maria's reputation, her livelihood, her future, everything is on the line, but the truth has a way of coming out. And in this courtroom, it will. The first witness was Claire Daniels, David's assistant. She fidgeted in her seat, avoiding eye contact with both Maria and David as Veronica questioned her. Miss Daniels, Veronica began, can you confirm that you were present when Mr. Prescott discovered the missing necklace? Claire nodded. Yes. And did you see the necklace with Miss Torres's cleaning supplies? Claire hesitated, her gaze darting toward David before she finally nodded. Yes, I did. Thank you. Veronica returned to her seat, satisfied. Alan stood, his expression calm but probing. Miss Daniels, you've worked for Mr. Prescott for several years, haven't you? Yes, Claire replied softly. Would you say he's, um, demanding? Claire hesitated. He has high standards. Alan stepped closer. And would you say those standards include controlling how things appear to others? Objection, Veronica snapped. Speculative. Sustained, the judge said, though Alan had already planted the idea. Alan leaned forward slightly. Miss Daniels, did you feel pressured to support Mr. Prescott's claims against Maria? Claire's lips parted, but she quickly shook her head. No? Alan nodded, giving her an out. That's all for now. When Maria was called to testify, she took a deep breath, her palms damp with sweat. Alan stood beside her, his presence a reassuring anchor. Maria, he began, tell us about the day you were accused. Maria recounted the confrontation, her voice steady despite the emotions bubbling beneath the surface. She described how the neck was found, how David dismissed her without listening, and how she left feeling humiliated. And during your years working for Mr. Prescott, Alan continued, did you ever steal or attempt to steal anything? Never, Maria said firmly. Alan's next question caused a ripple of murmurs in the courtroom. Maria, is there any reason you believe Mr. Prescott would want to silence you? Maria hesitated. The room seemed to hold its collective breath, waiting for her response. Miss Torres, Judge Harper said, her voice calm but commanding, you may answer the question. Maria drew a deep breath and met Alan's reassuring nod. Yes, there's something he doesn't want anyone to know. Alan leaned in slightly, his tone gentler but probing. What is that, Maria? What does Mr. Prescott want to hide? Maria swallowed hard but kept her focus. Mr. Prescott's daughter, Lila, she began, each word measured. She's been staying at his mansion. She's pregnant. The courtroom gasped. David's jaw clenched, his previously relaxed demeanor shaken. Maria continued, She came to me for help because she was scared, terrified, of what her father would do if he found out. The gallery erupted into murmurs. Reporters scribbled furiously as the jury exchanged startled glances. Judge Harper raised her gavel. Order! Order in the court! She barked. The room fell silent as everyone's attention returned to the center of the unfolding drama. Veronica Hayes, David's high-profile lawyer stood poised but visibly rattled. Objection, Your Honor. This testimony is irrelevant and speculative. Alan stepped forward before Judge Harper could respond. Your Honor, this 
testimony speaks directly to motive, he argued. If Mr. Prescott fired Maria to silence her, it undermines the credibility of his entire accusation. Judge Harper paused, her penetrating eyes flicking between Alan and Veronica. The room waited, tense and motionless, as she deliberated. Finally, she leaned forward slightly. The testimony will stand, she ruled. But Mr. Carter, you'd better ensure this line of questioning is going somewhere substantial. Alan nodded. Thank you, Your Honor. He turned back to Maria, who sat on the stand, her hands gripping the edge of the podium. Maria, can you tell us more about the situation with Lila? What happened when she came to you? She came to me late one night about two months ago, she began. She was crying, terrified. She told me she had nowhere else to go and that she was pregnant. Maria's voice steadied as she continued. She said she couldn't face her father. She was afraid of how he would react, afraid he'd force her to do something she didn't want to do. David shot up from his seat, his face red with fury. This is ridiculous, he bellowed. I have done nothing but support my daughter. Sit down, Mr. Prescott. Judge Harper's voice cut through his outburst, her gavel striking once more. You will not disrupt these proceedings again. David sank back into his chair, his lawyer frantically whispering in his ear, but the damage to his composure was already done. The jury exchanged uneasy glances, and Maria's courage only seemed to grow in the face of his anger. Maria, Alan promised, reclaiming the room's attention. What did you do after Lila confided in you? I tried to help her. I gave her food and let her stay in one of the guest rooms. I knew it was risky, but I couldn't turn her away. She's just a young girl and she needed someone. Alan nodded. And did you speak to anyone else about this? Did you try to inform Mr. Prescott? Maria hesitated, her eyes flickering toward David before returning to Alan. No, she admitted. Lila begged me not to. She said it wasn't safe that he would overreact. Alan turned to the jury, his expression somber but resolute. This, he said, gesturing toward Maria, is the real reason she was fired. Not because she stole a necklace, but because she showed compassion to a frightened young woman. A compassion Mr. Prescott didn't want anyone to know about. At that moment, the back doors of the courtroom opened. All heads turned as a young woman stepped inside, her face pale but resolute. Lila Prescott, visibly pregnant, walked down the aisle, her hands nervously clasped her rounded stomach, gasps rippled through the gallery, and even the judge's eyebrows lifted slightly in surprise. David's expression froze, his mouth slightly open, as if he couldn't believe what he was seeing. Lila's presence was a blow he hadn't anticipated. Alan exchanged a brief, encouraging glance with Lila before addressing the judge. Your Honor, with your permission, I'd like to call Lila Prescott to the stand. Veronica shot to her feet. Your Honor, this is highly irregular. Miss Prescott's testimony was not disclosed during pretrial. Judge Harper's gaze remained sharp and unwavering. Mr. Carter, do you have a justification for this late witness? Allen stood firm. Your Honor, Ms. Prescott's testimony is critical to understanding the context of my client's firing. Her presence was unanticipated due to her fear of retribution, but she's here now and willing to speak. After a long pause, Judge Harper nodded. Very well, Ms. Prescott, please take the stand. The courtroom hung in a fragile silence after Lila Prescott took the stand. She adjusted the the microphone nervously, avoiding her father's sharp gaze. The audience leaned forward in anticipation. This wasn't just a legal case anymore. It was a family unraveling in real time. My name is Lila Prescott, she began, her voice trembling but determined, and Maria is telling the truth. David's lips tightened, his polished facade cracking under the weight of her words. Veronica, his lawyer, subtly placed a hand on his arm to calm him, but David brushed her off, his fury simmering just below the surface. Alan Carter stood near the jury, his expression calm and encouraging, as he prompted Lila gently. Lila, could you explain why you felt you couldn't share your situation with your father? Lila hesitated, her gaze drifting to the gallery, where reporters scribbled furiously in their notepads. Because, she began, my father, he's never really been a dad to me. He's been more like a manager. Ever since I was a child, everything in our house was about appearances. My father was obsessed with making sure we looked perfect to the outside world. She paused, looking toward the jury. When I was seven, I spilled grape juice on the carpet during one of his business dinners. I remember how he yelled at me in front of everyone, calling me careless. I didn't understand why he was so angry over a carpet. Later, my nanny told me it wasn't the stain he cared about. It was the impression it left on his guests. The room was silent. The jury 
visibly engrossed. Alan encouraged her to continue. As I got older, it only got worse, Lila said. When I was in high school, I wanted to play soccer, but my father told me it wasn't refined enough for a Prescott. He made me join the debate team instead because he thought it would look better on my college application. She laughed bitterly, shaking her head. Every decision I made had to fit into this perfect image he wanted to project. It wasn't about me. It was about him. David shifted uncomfortably, his jaw clenched tightly. Alan pressed on. And how did this dynamic affect your relationship with him? Lila's eyes flickered to her father for a moment before dropping back to her hands. I stopped telling him things. It didn't matter what I wanted. He only cared about what made him look good. He didn't want a daughter, he wanted a showpiece. Alan approached cautiously, knowing the next question would strike deep. Lila, could you tell us how your pregnancy came about? What led you to seek Maria's help? Lila hesitated, her face pale but resolute. I met someone, she said quietly. His name was Jacob. He wasn't from my father's circle. He wasn't wealthy or influential. He worked at a local animal shelter. Her lips quirked into a bittersweet smile. Jacob was kind. He listened to me, treated me like a person, not an accessory. For the first time, I felt free. Alan nodded, letting her set the pace. And then, we started seeing each other in secret, Lila admitted. I knew my father would never approve. Jacob didn't come from money, and my father only. Values people who can benefit him. If he found out, he'd make Jacob's life miserable. Her voice faltered, and she took a deep breath. When I found out I was pregnant, I didn't know what to do. I wanted to tell Jacob, but I was scared. I knew my father would try to control the situation. Control how? Alan asked gently. Lila looked directly at Alan, her voice steady but filled with emotion. He would have forced me to end the pregnancy. He's always made it clear that anything less than perfection is a liability. A pregnant, unwed daughter doesn't fit Prescott brand. Maria steps in. Tears welled in Lila's eyes as she continued. I couldn't face him, so I went back to the mansion and tried to hide. I thought maybe I could figure things out on my own. That's when Maria found me. She glanced toward Maria, her expression softening. She could have turned me in. She could have told my father right away, but she didn't. She brought me food, listened to me, and helped me feel safe. Maria shifted in her seat, her own eyes brimming with unshed tears. Alan seized the moment to highlight Maria's role. Lila, did Maria ever ask for anything in return for helping you? No, Lila said firmly. She didn't want anything. She just wanted to help. Alan turned toward the jury, his voice clear and steady. Maria Torres showed compassion in a situation where most would have looked the other way. She protected Lila, not because she had anything to gain, but because it was the right thing to do. The courtroom had turned into a boiling cauldron of tension, with Maria's testimony and Lila's unexpected arrival shattering the composed facade David Prescott had cultivated for years. Before Alan Carter could proceed with his next question, Veronica Hayes rose swiftly from her chair. Your Honor, I need to address the court. Judge Harper's gaze narrowed. Miss Hayes, you'll have your chance during your client's defense. Sit down. With all due respect, Your Honor, Veronica pressed, her tone firm, this testimony is clearly biased and irrelevant. It's no secret that the relationship between Mr. Prescott and his daughter has been strained. This isn't a matter of truth. It's a personal vendetta designed to defame my client's reputation. The gallery buzzed with murmurs as Veronica turned to the jury, her voice measured but cutting. Lila Prescott has made it clear she disagrees with her father's parenting style, but what we're seeing here is not a pursuit of justice. It's an emotional outburst, manipulated by others to tarnish Mr. Prescott's name. Alan stood, his expression calm but unyielding. Objection, Your Honor, Miss Hayes is editorializing. The jury is capable of discerning the truth from Lila's testimony without this unnecessary commentary. Judge Harper raised her gavel. Sustained, Miss Hayes, you'll refrain from such statements. This court will decide the credibility of the witness. Before Allen could proceed, he called Claire Daniels, David's longtime assistant, to the stand. Sitting stiffly, she avoided David's glare, but her gaze briefly flickered to Maria, who looked at her with quiet hope. Miss Daniels, Allen began, his tone firm but not confrontational. You've worked with Mr. Prescott for how long? Seven years, Claire said, her voice measured but cautious. And in those seven years, you've been privy to his personal and professional dealings, correct? Yes, Allen nodded. Let's talk about the day Maria 
Torres was dismissed. Were you present? Yes, Claire said, her hands gripping the edge of the witness stand. I was there when Mr. Prescott accused her of stealing the necklace. And what was your impression of the situation? Alan pressed. Claire hesitated, glancing toward David, whose icy stare bore into her. She took a shaky breath. It didn't feel right, she admitted finally. The necklace appeared out of nowhere. Maria had been working for years without incident, and suddenly she's accused of theft. It felt orchestrated. Orchestrated by whom? Claire hesitated again, visibly struggling with her next words. By Mr. Prescott her voice barely above a whisper. He told me he wanted Maria gone and that the theft accusation was the cleanest way to get rid of her. David shot out of his chair, his face flushed with anger. Claire, what the hell are you saying? He bellowed. I trusted you. Sit down, Mr. Prescott, Judge Harper snapped, slamming her gavel. You will remain silent unless called to testify. David sank back into his chair, muttering under his breath, while Claire's shoulders slumped under the weight of her confession. Alan let the tension settle before continuing. Miss Daniels. Why would Mr. Prescott want to fire Maria? Because of Lila, she said. He knew Maria was helping her and wanted to shut her up before she could say anything. The gallery erupted into whispers again, and Alan turned back to Lila, who sat rigidly at the edge of her seat. Your Honor, I'd like to request permission to ask Miss Prescott further questions. Judge Harper glanced at Veronica, who offered no objection, knowing the tide was already turning against her client. Proceed, the judge said. Lila, can you tell us about the last argument you had with your father before you left home? Lila took a deep breath, her fingers gripping the edge of her chair. It was a few days before I found out I was pregnant, she began. I'd been seeing Jacob, and my father found out. He didn't know about the pregnancy yet, but he found messages on my phone. Her voice shook slightly as she continued. He was furious. He kept yelling about how Jacob wasn't good enough, that he wasn't from our circle, that he was going to ruin my future. Alan nodded. Did he ever ask how you felt about Jacob? No, he didn't care. He just kept talking about the family image, how I was embarrassing him by even associating with someone like Jacob. He called him a charity case. David bristled at her words, but remained silent under the judge's stern gaze. Alan pressed on. And how did that argument end? Lila's voice cracked. He told me if I didn't break it off, he'd cut me off completely. No money, no support, nothing. Alan's tone softened. What happened when you found out you were pregnant? Lila looked down, tears welling in her eyes. I panicked she admitted. I couldn't tell him. I knew he'd make me get an abortion. He wouldn't care what I wanted. He'd only see it as a liability. So, I left. I went back to the mansion to hide because I didn't know where else to go. That's when I found Maria. Alan turned to Maria. And Maria took you in? Yes. She gave me food, a place to stay. She treated me like a person when my own father, her voice trailed off, but the jury's faces showed they didn't need her to finish the thought. Unable to restrain himself any longer, David stood again, ignoring Veronica's attempts to pull him back down. You have no idea what I've done for you, Lila, he shouted, his voice filled with anger and desperation. Everything I've built, all of this, was for you, to give you a future. Lila turned to him, her face a mix of anger and sorrow. No, Dad, everything you built was for you. You didn't care about what I wanted, only about what made you look good. David's face twisted in frustration. Do you think I'm the villain here? You're the one who ran off with some boy who couldn't even... Stop it, Lila yelled. Jacob loved me. He treated me like I mattered, like I wasn't just pawn in some corporate game. And now he's gone because I was too scared to fight back. The courtroom fell silent, her words hanging heavy in the air. Alan seized the opportunity to redirect. Lila, what do you mean by gone? Lila's tears spilled over as she explained. Jacob left when I stopped answering his calls. I thought it would protect him from my father's wrath. I didn't tell him about the baby because I was afraid of what my father would do to him. Claire's voice broke the silence. She's right, she said, her tone soft but firm. All eyes turned to her. David didn't just control Lila. He controlled everyone in that house. He threatened to ruin Maria's life because she dared to show compassion. He made me lie for him for years. David slammed a fist on the table, but the cracks in his defense were now glaring. The jury's expressions showed their unease, and even Veronica seemed resigned to the inevitable. Alan turned back to the judge. Your Honor, this case is not no longer just about a stolen necklace. It's about a pattern of control and abuse that led to the wrongful firing of my client. Judge Harper's voice cut through the tension. Proceed with closing arguments, Mr. Carter, but I believe the jury has heard enough. Maria's heart swelled with hope as she exchanged a brief glance with Lila. For the first time in weeks, it felt like justice might finally prevail. 
The courtroom was silent as the final gavel strike echoed, signaling a brief recess before the jury would deliberate. Alan Carter leaned in, his voice calm and steady. You've done everything you can, Maria. The truth is out. Now we wait. Across the room, David Prescott sat stiffly at the defense table, his once confident demeanor now replaced by simmering frustration. His eyes darted toward Lila, who sat in the gallery beside Maria. Her face was resolute, her hand resting protectively on her swollen stomach. The judge returned to her seat, signaling the jury's entrance. The room was tense, every person holding their breath. Finally, the four persons stood and read the verdict. In the case of Maria Torres versus David Prescott, we find the defendant guilty of wrongful termination and defamation. Maria's breath caught in her chest. As Alan gave her a reassuring nod, the judge banged her gavel once to restore order. Mr. Prescott, this court finds that your actions were not only unethical, but maliciously intended to ruin Miss Torres's reputation. You are ordered to pay damages to the plaintiff and issue a public apology. David's face twisted in indignation. Apology, he spat, his voice low but venomous. I owe no one an apology. Judge Harper's gaze was like steel. Mr. Prescott, this is not optional. If you refuse, further penalties will be imposed. Veronica leaned in, her whisper sharp. David, don't make this worse than it already is. He glared at her but sank back in his chair, visibly fuming. As the court adjourned, Maria stood, overwhelmed by a wave of relief. Lila approached her, her eyes filled with gratitude. Maria, thank you for everything. Maria pulled her into a gentle embrace. You don't need to thank me. You're brave, Lila, braver than I ever was. Alan joined them, his face warm with pride. Maria, you've done more than clear your name. You've shown everyone the power of standing up for the truth. Maria nodded, but her eyes were drawn to David, who stood rigid as reporters swarmed around him. His apology was hollow and curt, but Maria didn't care. She had her integrity back, and that was worth more than his empty words. As the crowd began to disperse, Lila approached her father. For a moment, David's icy mask faltered, replaced by something more vulnerable, perhaps regret. Lila, his voice lacking its usual authority, I never meant for things to get this far. Lila's expression hardened. You didn't mean for it to get this far because you were trying to control everything, like you always do. You didn't care about me, Dad. You cared about how I made you look. That's not true. But even he seemed unconvinced by his own words. He looked at her stomach, his face clouded with emotion. You should have come to me. And risk losing my baby? Lila Lila's voice cracked, but her resolve remained. I wanted to believe you'd change, but I couldn't take that chance. Maria showed me what real compassion looks like. Maybe one day you'll learn from her. David opened his mouth to respond, but Lila turned and walked away. For the first time in his life, David Prescott was left speechless. Weeks later, Maria stood in her modest but cozy living room, the sunlight streaming through the windows. Javier, her teenage son, set the table for dinner, a grin lighting up his face. Mama, you're you're famous, he teased, holding up a newspaper featuring her story. Everyone's talking about how you stood up to the great David Prescott. Maria chuckled softly, ruffling his hair. It wasn't just me, she said. It was Lila and Claire and Alan. I had people who believed in me. The sound of a knock at the door interrupted their conversation. Maria opened it to find Lila standing there, holding a small bouquet of flowers. Hi, Lila said. I wanted to thank you again. I don't think I could have done this without you. Maria smiled warmly. Come in, Lila. You're always welcome here. As Lila stepped inside, Maria's heart swelled. She had fought not only for her own dignity, but also for a young woman who had needed her. It wasn't just justice that had been served. It was hope, compassion, and the strength to stand against those who misuse their power. In the grand Prescott mansion, David sat alone in his study. The luxurious room felt suffocating now, its cold grandeur a reminder of everything he had sacrificed for success. For years, he had controlled every facet of his life, believing it would make him invincible. But his daughter's words echoed in his mind, maybe one day you'll learn from her. David looked at a framed photo of Lila as a child, smiling brightly, unburdened by his expectations. For the first time in years, he felt a pang of something unfamiliar. 
Shame. Maria, Lila, and Javier sat around the dinner table, laughter filling the air. The warmth of their connection was undeniable, a stark contrast to the cold detachment of David's life. Maria had reclaimed her life, Lila had found her strength, and together they had shown that even in the face of power and arrogance, integrity and compassion could prevail. As the sun set outside, Maria looked around the table, her heart full. She didn't need riches or recognition. She had everything she needed right here. 